Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about a new study that might give us a little bit more idea about how the early solar system was created and more specifically how many and what kind of supernova were responsible for well, basically creating us as well. You might have heard this before that you know we are all stardust, we're all made out of really ancient supernova that exploded a long time ago and basically spread their material across vast regions of space with some of this material eventually creating our own planet and some of that material later creating us as well. For example, this table of elements right here kind of shows you where a lot of the elements are from and how they were formed. Hydrogen and helium along with some lithium are the only things that were born in the beginning of the universe. A lot of the other stuff was created either through the explosion of stars or through some other major cataclysmic events. So for example, everything you see in gold or in this color right here, that's basically very large, very massive stars undergoing type 2 supernova, sometimes also known as core collapse supernova. And that's when a massive star basically explodes and leaves behind some sort of remnant such as a neutron star or a black hole. And a lot of other elements, specifically stuff you see right here that's in grayish white color, that's exploding white dwarfs or type 1 supernova. Usually this happens when a white dwarf gets enough mass from its partner or possibly from another white dwarf that it collides with and that usually results in a really large, really powerful explosion that often is used for a lot of scientific reasons as well because it tends to produce the same amount of energy. These type 1a supernova were responsible for creating other elements. Here's actually what the typical nebula looks like after this explosion occurs. But there are actually several other sources of elements as well. For example, merging neutron stars which brought a lot of gold and platinum, cosmic rays which brought a lot of lithium, beryllium and boron, and even some other unusual cataclysmic events which might have brought even more materials. So trying to figure out where all of the stuff in, for example, our bodies came from has actually been always a curiosity for a lot of scientists. But in order to try to understand what happened in the beginning of the solar system and where the material came from, one of the major ways scientists usually do this is by using various meteorites and by then trying to find different ratios of different isotopes inside of those meteorites in order to establish certain age of certain particles. One of the reasons meteorites are preferred for this is because they actually didn't change much in the last few billions of years as they orbited around the solar system. Stuff here on Earth does change because of chemical reactions, but if you were to take a meteorite that stayed in outer space for 4 billion years, it's most likely going to be very similar to how it originally was when the solar system was just created. But first, very briefly about isotopes, with the example here being hydrogen. Normally, if you were to take an element such as hydrogen and expose this element to a lot of radiation such as, for example, in a supernova, it will start acquiring extra neutrons on the inside, thus increasing its weight and creating what's known as isotopes. These isotopes are not stable though, and with time they will actually lose this extra neutron, eventually turning into something else. Now, one such famous example is based on uranium lead dating. And it's when we take uranium-238 and try to measure the ratio between that uranium and another element known as lead-206. We know that after about 4.47 billion years, half of the uranium will actually turn into lead. This is a very well studied and well established fact, and though somewhat complex, kind of looks like this. There's basically this really long chain of elements turning from one to another until eventually after this long series it all ends up as the atom known as lead 206 and this one here is stable and will no longer change. Knowing this fact we can actually use this to start measuring the age of different rocks and that's basically how uranium dating works. Because we know that after about 4.47 billion years half of this uranium become that particular lead particle, by measuring the ratio we can usually very accurately estimate the age of rocks. Which by the way was one of the isotopes used in this study. But naturally there are other isotopes we can use for even more precision, specifically ones that have much shorter half-life. And more specifically in this paper they used one isotope that's now officially extinct. This one right here known as Niobium-92 which eventually ends up being the atom known as Zirconium-92, which is the stable part of this chain. Now the thing about Niobium-92 is that 
it's only extinct because its half-life is only about 37 million years. But that type of a half-life is actually perfect to study certain events such as the creation of the solar system and trying to actually investigate how things changed in the early solar system. But in order to make this work, the scientists obviously have to take several different isotopes from the same sample and then compare their ratios in order to create some sort of an accurate timeline of how things went and how things changed over time in that particular period. Because remember, we're currently right here, we're about 4.5 billion years after the creation of the solar system, and the scientists are interested in studying this right here, the birth of the solar system. And mostly because the scientists really want to find out what sort of supernova were responsible for adding a lot of different elements to the solar system. And so the scientists whose paper you can find in the description below were able to combine these isotopes and used a completely untouched by nature pristine sample of zircon that was actually discovered inside one of the meteorites known as Vestoids. The meteorite that originally came from the larger object known as Vesta, the protoplanet that never really became a planet. Now we know that these objects are pristine and for the most part are kind of untouched by anything and because of this samples from Vesta have always been kind of interesting for scientists studying the early solar system. And so by studying these particular rocks, they were able to establish how much of this extinct element of 92 niobium existed in the early solar system, thus allowing them to see how things changed early on and what kind of early events influenced the solar system when the planets were just created. And so by studying these particular rocks, the scientists were able to establish how much of that extinct niobium 92 existed in the early solar system and thus how the solar system evolved and what sort of events, what sort of supernova influenced various parts of the solar system. And according to the scientists, because these minerals that they used in the study were basically pristine and untouched, they were the perfect opportunity to determine how much of that extinct niobium existed in the early solar system. And so by using these Vestoid meteorites, they were able to improve the so-called 92-92 niobium zirconium chronometer which then allowed them to date the early solar system much more accurately. Which in theory would provide precise information about the formation of all of these early objects including asteroids and uh, early planetoids in the early solar system. But for this particular study what they discovered was essentially that the inner solar system, the part where Earth, Mars, Venus and Mercury are located, were actually largely influenced by type 1a supernova. And so that's of course the type when there is a white dwarf involved and possibly another star where the white dwarf basically captures its mass or another white dwarf that it collides with. So something like this happens in the relative vicinity of the solar system approximately four and a half billion years ago and then delivered a lot of this material to the solar system and a lot of this stuff basically made our planets. However, it's also possible that this is something that might have happened a long time ago because a lot of these elements could have come from a completely different part of the galaxy. On the other hand, the outer part of the solar system, the part where Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus and a lot of other stuff is, were influenced by type 2 supernova. And that's the core collapse supernova when massive stars, very likely located not so far away from where the solar system was forming, basically collapsed, exploded and created really large amounts of gas and a lot of different materials that essentially got enriched through the radiation from the supernova and then ended up in the outer regions of the solar system. Which of course totally makes sense because if we were to look at other molecular clouds such as the Orion Nebula where a lot of stars are being created right now as well, we know that a lot of this gas came from various supernova in the past. And a lot of the stars that are currently really massive and are still located in this region are also going to explode and basically mix all of their material with the rest of the star systems forming there. Some of these star systems are probably going to become similar to the solar system, with a lot of this material eventually forming planets, comets, asteroids and so on. And so in that sense it's actually kind of interesting to see that the scientists for the most part figured out that there were at least two different types of supernova responsible for creating the planets and a lot of the other stuff in our own solar system. So once again with the inner part representing the material that was created during some sort of a type 1a supernova when the white dwarf exploded and everything else, the outer part of the solar system, 
being represented by a type 2 supernova, possibly even more than one. More importantly, at least one of these supernova happened during a time when the solar system was being formed. Which of course once again confirms that, well, we are star stuff after all. A lot of the heavy elements in our bodies, or basically everything that's not hydrogen, helium and not lithium, very likely was created in these powerful explosions happening around the early solar system about 4.5 billion years ago. And this study establishes that it wasn't just one, it was at least two, but very likely a lot more. But that's something that future studies will hopefully determine with a little bit more accuracy. For now, all we know is that a lot of exciting things happened in the solar system in the beginning, and it sounds like by seeing similar events happening in the regions like the Orion's Belt, we can be pretty certain that a lot of very exciting star systems are going to be created in the future as well. And maybe at least one of them will also have some sort of an extraterrestrial intelligence one day living there and exploring the life and the universe around it. But I guess for now, well, I guess all we can do is just wait for future studies that will actually determine the timeline with even more precision and more accuracy. For now, check out the paper in the description, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel memberships or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Either way, I'll see you tomorrow, stay wonderful, and as always, bye bye.